appreciate that, Miss Kendra, Miss Stephanie. Uh, there is Children's Church this morning, so for those that will be going there, be dismissed for the rest of us. Let us stand together and turn our Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. Scripture reads there in Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. It says, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, let him hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, and whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest haply after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet great way off, he sendeth ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsake not all that he hath cannot be my disciples. For salt is good, but if salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? Is It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for a dunghill, but men cast it out, and he that hath an ear, let him hear. Dear Heavenly Father, as we bow before you this morning, we thank you so much for just the time of worship. Lord, I'm thankful for the t songs that we've been able to sing as we think about um, the power in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I appreciate uh, Stephanie's being sensitive to your leadership. That song was on my heart and my mind, and, and I almost made the call to ask her to sing it. I'm thankful, Lord, that you moved in her heart that way because this morning we need to be reminded again that the power is in the name of Christ. It's the name that's above every name. It's a name in which one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. It's also that the name of Jesus in which the enemy must flee. It's in the name of Jesus in which we have access to your throne. It's in the name of Jesus in which we overcome this world. We overcome death, hell, and the grave. And so, Lord Jesus, we ask you to continue to be high and lifted up in this place. And it's in your name that I ask you for a fresh anointing of your spirit to preach your word. And it's in your name that I ask, Lord, that each of us would have ears to hear what the Spirit of God has to say to us. And Lord, if it's somebody in this sanctuary or listening through Facebook or listening on the radio, I pray whoever and wherever they may be, there's a lost person You'd do a work in their hearts, showing them their lostness, drawing them unto yourself that they might be saved. And Lord, for us who are saved, I pray for revival. I pray for an excitement. I pray for a fire from on high, a stirring of the Spirit of God in our lives. And Lord, we need you. For without you, we are nothing. We can accomplish nothing. We do nothing of any eternal value. And so, Lord, we just lay ourselves at your feet and we ask you to raise us up and to use us for your glory. So I ask for your help to preach as we give you the praise, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Counting the cost, the commitment to Jesus. You know, as we think about counting the cost, I'm sure everybody in this room, one time or another, if you haven't, you probably should, uh, think about your budget right? 
You think about how everything is going up. You think about the cost of milk and eggs and bread and gas and just the basic necessities to get through life. You think about the possible hike and electricity and all the different things that they talk about, and then you start looking at your own income, and you say, well, everything else is going up, but I've yet to have a meeting with my boss that says, I'd like to give you a raise. I'd like to make sure that your cost of living, as it goes up, so also will your income go up. Um, probably very few of any of us have received such a conversation. And even for those that may have got somewhat of a Social Security increase of about 8%, the reality is you can look around and see that groceries have went up about 100%. So your little 8.7% raise, which may sound good, doesn't come close to what the increase is going on around you. So we count the costs a lot of times for a lot of things, don't we? I mean, sometimes we ignore those costs and it later on bites us. A lot of folks have, uh, you know, buyer's remorse after Christmas and it starts getting into the year after, and especially if you've used a credit card and you ain't felt the pain yet, eventually it's going to come get you and you're going to have to eventually pay the piper. So we think about it, think about the cost of things in life. Well, as we think about living for Jesus, uh, there's a cost, folks. And I want to talk to you about that cost because uh, even though salvation is free and our sin debt has been paid for through the person and the works of the Lord Jesus Christ, when a person gets saved, there are some expectations of our Lord. And the expectations is that that he wants some of you, it's that he wants all of you. He wants you in an entirety because he went and paid for you in an entirety. Amen? So if you go to the store and you purchase something and you get home and you start to unwrap that or maybe you go to the, it's, it's, it's easier done it seems to me at the fast food restaurant. But you go and you go through the line and you order it and they say things like this. Does um, your order match what's on the screen? And you say yes. And they say, well, this is what the cost is. And you say, okay, thank you. And you go up to the first window and you pay them at the first window. And when you get to the second window, they give you with a smile your drink. And sometimes and most of the time at McDonald's, those little automatic pop filler uppers don't give you 100% of that cup either, do they? It's about that much missing at the top. And you say, you know, you paid for the whole thing. But you got that much and that bothers me enough. And then you get the bag with a smile and then you get in your vehicle and you want to go on because you've been waiting in some, in, in behind someone else. And you pull out and you start divvying out the food if you're going somewhere or worse, you go all the way home and you start getting the food out and it just happens to be you don't have all the food. You're mad, ain't you? Why are you mad? Because... That list was on the screen, and they didn't take some of your money at that first window. They took all the money at that first window. And when you got what you thought you paid for and you were home, you didn't get both those cheeseburgers. You only got one of those cheeseburgers. Or you didn't get whatever ass you asked. And I'll tell you what makes me mad, too, is that they don't decide to give you, these days, napkins in the bag no more. You've got to ask for them. And I don't like the little signs on there that says you got to ask for condiments. Hey, if I got fries, put ketchup in the bag. Hello? Why? Because I paid for that, right? Well, I say all that to say that when you and I come to know Jesus as our own personal Lord and Savior, and we have cried out to him to forgive us and to save us and to apply his blood to our lives and to take our sin away and give us his righteousness, guess what he expects to get in return? All of us, not some of us. He doesn't expect to open up the bag, folks, and be missing part of the meal. Huh? But I'll tell you what we do. We think that we can pull one 
on an all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, eternal God. Hey, Jesus didn't come up here and shed some of his blood for you. He came up here and shed all his blood for you. He didn't come and give part of his life for you. He came and gave his whole life for you, okay? And so when I think about living for Jesus, we must count the cost. And if you've never known Jesus, if you've never been saved, I'm not trying to deter you, but I want to be as plain and as open and as transparent as I know how to you, okay? If you are lost, you're on a broad path, and you're on your way to a devil's hell, okay? But in order to be saved, you've got to turn from your sin and give yourself to Jesus. But Jesus has an expectation from you, and he expects you to live for him not only as your Savior, but to surrender to Him as your Lord, or His Lord, yeah, as, as surrender to Him as your Lord. That's what He expects out of us. So many times I've heard people share the gospel over the years, and out of fear that the person that they're talking to won't receive Jesus, they don't seem to give all of the truth, so to speak. They may talk about their sin. They may talk about their need to be saved. They may talk about the need to believe on Jesus who died for them and rose again. But for whatever reason, we just kind of leave out the fact that he expects us to be committed to him. A life of commitment. Now, I'm not saying that your works saves you, but what I am saying is as a person who is saved and changed by the grace of Almighty God, the power of of a sacrificial death and a resurrected life of Jesus, there's an expectation for you and I to be committed to him. And as we move forward into a new year, there's all kinds of plans and ideas and changes that we want to make in our lives. And we just believe in fresh starts. And so because of fresh starts, and that's not a bad thing, these things are, seem to take place at the beginning of every year. And how long they last? That's up to you. But that's how we start, is it not? The New Year's resolution thing is something that's been going on for who knows how long, maybe since the, every time there's a new year. I don't know. But people have been coming up with these New Year resolutions. I'm going to get into those clothes that are hanging in my closet that I won't throw away because or give away because I think, you know what, eventually I'm going to get skinny enough to get back in them. And so I'm going to start this year and I'm going to start with whatever diet, or if you don't want to call it a diet, you want to call it your life change, whatever it is, to get back into those clothes, that's what you're going to do. And that does real good until you get a sweet tooth, or whatever it may be. And that's your, that's your New Year's resolution, or I'm going to change this, or I'm going to change that. But let me tell you something. When you think about being saved, you don't get no better fresh new chance. For the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. When you think about a fresh start, when you think about a clean slate, the Bible says that when a person trusts in Jesus as their own personal Lord and Savior, guess what he does with our sin? He casts it as far as the east is from the west. He casts it into the depths of the sea of forgetfulness to remember it no more. You made a new life in Christ, and now you can live for him, and now you can live in a way in which he intended for us to live in the first place. But that freedom we have now to live for him, guess what? There's an expectation to be committed to him and to surrender to him. So when I think about counting the cost of following after Jesus, there's several things in this passage that I think we need to get a grasp on. And when I think about this, I think about that Jesus seems to say things like this every time the crowd gets big. And it's not because Jesus doesn't like a big crowd. He just doesn't want the crowd to be there for no reason. So we all get in the crowd, right? There's plenty of churches today that have big crowds. But they have big crowds, and they ain't for the right reasons. 
And I want a big crowd. I want every pew to be filled here. I want us to have issues with how to park. I want us to have issues on how to seat. I want us to have issues that there's so many folks that we don't know, we don't know what to do. But at the same time as that, you know what I want as well? The few that's here to be 100% sold out to him. That's what I want first. Because a crowd that's not committed doesn't matter. A crowd that is not sold out to Jesus is just simply a crowd. You know, I'm going to go home a little while and probably flip on the TV and I'm going to watch a big crowd. And they're going to watch somebody go up and down a, 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 a field that's 100 yards long and 50 yards wide. And those folks are going to have on different types of equipment like pads and helmets. And they're going to throw this little oblong type leather ball around. And when one catches it, somebody else is going to plow them. And there's going to be a big crowd there. And there's going to be a big crowd in these stadiums of people that are going to be dressed funny, that are going to be yelling, they're going to be shouting, they're going to be acting crazy. And some's going to have, it's going to be in the cold, and they ain't barely going to have enough clothes on. I'm not talking about naked people either, okay? So don't get all crazy. But still, I, I, I did it last year when the Cincinnati Bengals went and played at home and the first time in the playoffs in several years. And they were there to play the, 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 the Las Vegas Raiders. And I was pumped up because it had been 31 years since the Cincinnati Bengals won a playoff game. So I took A.J. And me and A.J. went up there and we watched the game. And I stood for three hours in the cold. My feet were frozen. My nose was frozen. But we won a playoff game. We ain't run in 31 years. Holler, scream, yell, couldn't barely talk when it was all done. For what reason? I like the game, and I like the team. But it amount to anything? No. No. You know what happens most of the time on my teams that I like? End of the year, they short of where I want to be. And you know what I say? It's always next year. You know what I do at the beginning of the next year when they start? Guess what I say when they say, who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl? I say, since they bang them. Who's going to win the World Series? They say, hey, Rams. Who's going to win the NCAA tournament? UK Wildcats. You know what I've learned? That every one of them stink, including the UK Wildcats. You ain't care. Now, the Bengals on the roll, so don't be talking about them. But I say all that to say you can get a crowd, folks. You can get a crowd together to follow a ball. You can get a crowd together to watch two men beat their brains out. You can go get a crowd of, of to do whatever you want. They're going to drop the ball right in the middle of town or the middle of New York. don't make any sense to me. You know, get all pumped up, excited to watch a ball fall from the sky. It don't even make no sense to me. I don't know where the tradition comes from. I never Google it, don't have really care about it. But I don't understand any of that. You drop the ball to start things off. I thought you supposed to hang on to the ball. I don't understand, but guess what people do? They gather around, they get around. You get people everywhere. Jesus got the crowds, folks. When they were hungry, he fed them. When they were naked, he clothed them. When they were sick, he healed them. When they were oppressed, he delivered them. When they were dead, he made them to rise again. When their arms didn't work, he gave them new ones. When they couldn't walk, he caused them to walk. When they couldn't see, they all of a sudden seen. When they couldn't hear, they listened. And listen, God moved in people's lives, and the crowds got big, but Jesus wasn't there just to feed a hungry belly or to bring some healing to someone who was sick. Jesus came that men might be born again and saved and lives changed and quit following after the enemy and now follow after him, the one true and living God. That's what he came for. So when the crowd got big, he teach them a truth that either you ready to lock in and hang on or follow him or you was going to bounce. Many of them left. And he says here, as the multitude was with him, he turned and said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, not his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. When we think about our commitment to the Savior, he has got to take precedence over every one in our life. Everyone. Now, I want you to hear me now, okay? 
when we live for him, we live for the church. You understand that, right? Because those two are one. Paul asked me a question today. He said, when two or three are gathered in my name, in the midst, he's going to be like a riddle. He said, so now if me and Stephanie are together in prayer, is he in the midst? And I said, well, yeah. He said, well, but two are one. So he's trying to give me in a trick. But yes, he's in the midst, even on the two of one. But in Ephesians also, where he talks about two or one, you remember when Jesus said, I'm talking to you concerning Christ and the church. And so when folks talk about being committed to Jesus, but are not committed to the body of Christ, you are not committed to Jesus. Mark that down. You don't have to amen loud if you want to or not. It don't matter to me. I just want you to listen. And I want you to mark it down. You cannot be committed to Jesus. You're not committed to the church. You cannot be. And then, if you want to get a little more specific, we can. Because it's not just, we say, the church in a general sense and thinking that you and I can run rogue. There is local church. In fact, the apostle Paul, who was an apostle set aside out of due season, who met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Did he go rogue and do what he wanted? No, he did not. When he was sent out, he was there sent out by a local church in Antioch of Syria. Was he not? He was. They laid their hands upon him and they sent him out as not an apostle, but as a missionary, as a church planner from there. And that's where he spent the remaining days of his life. Did he not? He did. And so when we think about our commitment to Jesus, folks, I want you to hear me. Our commitment to Jesus is in correlation or it goes right along with being committed to the church. So with all that said, if we're going to be committed to him, he must take precedence over every relationship in our life. Every relationship. Our children, our spouses, our parents, our loved ones, our neighbors, our co-workers, every relationship that we have, Jesus must be number one unashamedly. Right? That's what we have to do. And I know things get, get, get a little bit hairy there all of a sudden, and you start saying, I don't know, that gets difficult. I mean, aren't we supposed to, to, to show the love of Christ to these people? You are. That's the neat thing about it. When, you, when it talks about hating your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brother, your sister, so on and so forth, Jesus is talking about loving less, okay? It's not that you despise. You just can't take a little passage and ignore the rest of the Bible. Because for kids, it tells us that we're to honor our mother and father, Right? So we know we're supposed to do that. You want to live longer, you honor your mother and your father. Right? The Bible says that. But it just said you have to hate them. Well, in comparison to your commitment to Jesus, should be as such. That means that he's got to be first over your mom and your dad. Right? You remember the fellow that said, hey, I'll, I'll follow you, but let me go bury my father first. Jesus said, you let the dead bury the dead. You go preach the gospel. You mean... Jesus expects you to be somewhere else preaching the gospel when you, even you have to bury your father? That's exactly what he said. What are you going to do for someone who's already dead? Uh-oh. Somebody's got one of them. Go see the urologist. Lord help us. I don't even know what you say to that. Turn them phones off. I guess the only thing I know to say to it. But with that said, he said, you let the dead bury the dead. You, you can't say, well, I got to take care of my father. I know you got to do the father's business is what you got to do. And I'm not talking about your earthly father. I'm talking about the heavenly father. We got to be about the father's business. That's what Jesus was doing. You remember when they lost Jesus? Could you imagine 
I've lost my own child, but can you imagine just misplacing the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us? I mean, Mary didn't forget that she had a miraculous conception. Joseph didn't forget that he was the stepdaddy of God in the flesh. And somehow or another, in the big old parade of going home from Jerusalem, they're like, where's Jesus? Well, you had him. No, you had him. No, you had him. Well, they had him. No, they ain't got him. But when they went back and found him, he was there in the temple. He said, what are you sweating? I'm here about the Father's business, my Father's business. We are to be about the Father's business. We, we are to, in every relationship, our mother, our father, our children. Listen, moms and dads, your children shouldn't be dictating where you go to church, when you go to church, all these types of things. I meet, I meet families all the time. And they say, well, my kids just don't really like this church, or my kids want to go over there. No, you be the mom and dad. Will you be the spiritual leader at your house? Will you teach your children the importance of being committed to Jesus? Because one day they're going to grow up, and one day they're going to make their own decisions. And guess what? If you haven't been influenced, someone else has. Whether it's at, at school or on that little YouTube or whatever else that they've got access to, somebody is going to influence your children why not it be you and whom God has entrusted with? But they shouldn't be directing. You should be the ones directing, and you should be putting Jesus above them. I love my kids, but ain't none of them could, and nor did they ever go and give their life for me. Only one person that had a child that was able to die for them and take care of their sin, and that was Mary giving birth to Jesus. But ain't nobody else had a child that could pay for their sin debt. You said, well, you're supposed to take care of you. You're right. You tell me a better way to take care of your kids than show them that I'm putting Jesus first. Tell me a better way. Tell me a better way. Because at the end of the day, you can teach them every trade coming and going. You can show them all the little so-called love that the world tells you you're supposed to show. You can accept them however they are and whatever they do. And most of the time, that's exactly what we do. For not for their good, most of the time for their demise. And you know what happens when they get old? And they don't, don't follow Jesus, they die without him. And then all of a sudden, that all that thing that you thought was good for their life wasn't a good for him. Jesus should be number one with your parents, with your kids, with your spouse. Listen, husbands, you got to be leading your family. And listen to the wives over here. Now listen, the Bible talks in Peter about how you ought to love, if you got a spouse that doesn't live, live for the Lord and you're a wife, he says, listen, you learn how to be submissive. You don't do things contrary to the word of God. But you learn how to be submissive, and you show the love of Christ that way, but you need to come on to church, okay? You, you husbands, you need to come on to church. You need to lead your family on to church. And if they don't want to come, you need to come. You need to do what you're supposed to. I'm not talking about giving your kids options. I'll just be honest with you. That's the craziest thing I've heard of. You know, there's no way my kids going to have options. You got an option on a lot of other things. It sure ain't gonna have an option on that. Now, when it comes down to, to your spouse, I'm not telling you you gotta hog tie your spouse and bring them to church that you need to come on. Hmm? And if they don't like it, you tell them to take it up with Jesus. Huh? Because he's the one whom you're gonna answer to, and he's the one they're gonna answer to. But we've got to count the cost, folks. When you want to get saved and you want to get out of hell and you want to go to heaven and you want the eternal, all-powerful God to work in your life, guess what? There's some cost. It wasn't I'm just going to get out of hell free and that's all. No, it means that I'm going to live for Jesus when I got saved. We got to count that cost. What about your own self? Not only should he take 
precedence over your relationships, but what about your own self? He said, your own life. If any man hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brother, his sister, yea, his own life. You got to, verse 27 says, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Paul said it like this, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Amen? Oh, the world and the devil has done a good job of making us think that if you're a saved person, you live for Jesus. Oh, man, it's a boring life. It's a life where you, you, you know, it's just like you, you can't do nothing. No, when you die to yourself, you get to live in and through Christ. And you talk about living, you never lived before. You've never had a peace and a joy and an assurance and a confidence and a security in this old world. I can promise you that. You know how I know? These folks that appear to be confident, these famous people, these folks that seem to have it all coming and going, I don't know what you do. Every once in a while on Yahoo, it'll pop up, you know, what so-and-so looked like before, what they look like now. And I can't help but every once in a while I just click on. And you know what it shows me? They ain't never was confident in who they were. They weren't secure in it. They weren't happy in it. You know how I know? Because they go and have every procedure they got coming and going. And I don't know who told them that that was a better look, but it sure was. Most of them look like they got a whole tube of that collagen blew up in their jaws and in their lips and in their eyebrows. In every which way that they got coming and going, it ain't for migraines neither. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go look. They put a little shot in your forehead to help you with migraines. I'm talking about look silly. I'm talking about physically altering their different parts of their body to try to make them feel better about themselves. I'm talking about some of the craziest things. But I tell you this, when I got saved, I started learning who I was in Christ. I don't care if anybody out there in the world knows who I am, but I know that I'm a child of the king. I know that. I don't care if my bank account agrees with it or not. I am joint heirs with Jesus, folks. Hey, I might not have an inheritance at this moment, but I got one reserved for me in glory. Huh? And I don't have to worry about what everybody else thinks about me. I know who I am in Christ Jesus, folks. But Jesus wants us to die to our old self. He wants us to take up our cross and follow after him. It's time for us to count the cost, church. It's time for us to only count the cost, but realize it's worth the cost. Most folks will tell you, you're going to get what you pay for. Whatever effort you put into, that's what you're going to get, right? And most folks don't have a problem with different things like that. That's why they put all the sacrifice they put into whatever they want to do. I mean, in regular life and just different things. I mean, same thing. I mean, other, other day, me and Annabelle, we practice. I tell Julie, I'll just get a whim. Hey, I, tell Annabelle, be ready. We're going to practice. Well she, well, she ain't feeling good today. Or she, I said, you tell her, be ready. We're going to go pitch. And if she's, she's learned, she better not be whining when I get home. She might whine while I ain't there. But when I get there, she better not be whining about it. And we went on uh, last Tuesday. It was terrible. It was one of the worst practices we had lately. It was terrible. I was mad. She's crying. We was all tore up. She couldn't throw. I, I, I said, enough. We got done that practice. I put them balls up. She said, I ain't no good at pitching. And I said, I'll be honest with you. Today, you were terrible. That's true. But that don't mean one practice. Defines everything. So we came back. And she done real well. The next practice we had. I said, see? But you got to put forth some effort. 
Let me tell you something. Living for Jesus is not easy. Living for Jesus, there's days you're just terrible at it. Isn't there? Isn't there days that you just stink at being a Christian? Does that mean you just quit? Does that mean you're throwing a towel? Does that mean, no, no, you don't. And when you fall down, you get back up. When you realize you're terrible at it, you say, God, I don't know what you want with me, but I'm a mess. And he's going to say, I agree with you. You're terrible. But that's why I saved you by my grace. That's why I keep you by my grace. That's why I began a good work in you. And when it's all said and done, you ain't going to be terrible. You're going to be like me. Amen? But it comes with a cost. But I'm going to tell you what the end result is. So it's going to be out of this world. But you got to count the cost, folks. It just don't happen like this. You save like that. You justify just like that. But the process of sanctification is just that. It's a process. And eventually, glorification is going to happen. But you got to learn to die to your old self. You got to learn to take up the cross. You got to count the cost. I, I like the analogy that he says. He says, listen, the man who's intending to build a tower sits down. Does he not sit down first and he count the cost? To make sure he's got enough money to finish it? Because if not, he's going to start it, and then he can run out of money, and he's not going to finish the project, and everybody's going to look and say, what's this person doing? What a goofball. Julie lived down in Bell County, and there's a house that's right down from where mom and dad live. I don't know who owns the house. I don't know the purpose of the house. I don't really know if they live in it. I don't know if they just got something and they are in construction and they just practice on the house. I don't know what they do. But you, every time you go by it, it's a new project, but it never gets finished. It's like a new siding, but they go about halfway up it, three quarters of it, and then they quit. It's like they get sick of that. And then they try something else. And Julie's like, why do they not ever finish the house? It bothers her real bad. I mean, she don't live there. She don't own it. She don't have no part of it. She just passes it. And she gets really bothered by it. I mean, I think it looks silly, but it don't really bother me that much. But it bothers her. Why do they not finish that? I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's the same thing, folks. And let me tell you something. You know why it's important for us to follow after Christ? Because there's some people wanting to know. Is he really going to finish that? Huh? I had a buddy of mine. It's a sad situation, really. Grew up together. He's a little bit older than me. His name's Anthony, too. And uh, I didn't know this about him until just like this past year. And this, but uh, he's got like Parkinson's or something like that. And uh, he lives in a, like in a nursing facility now. Um, he can't really do much whole lot for himself. But anyway, when I first got saved, um, I talked to him, invited him to come to church, and he came to church with me. And he went to church with me, and we came back to my apartment, and we were sitting out there in the parking lot talking and things like this. And, you know, he's, when we were talking, he's using some language that wasn't, you know, appropriate. And I just kind of flipped my Bible over to a passage of Scripture. and I said, man, the Bible talks about us not using filthy communication and so on and so forth. And, and he kind of got offended by it, you know, and never to come to church with me again. And, I ran into him again, and he was like, so you still don't cuss? <laughs> I said, no, don't cuss. No. Running to people, they say this, people run to me, uh, you still preaching? I think that's almost a silly question, but a lot of people quit. I say, yeah, I'm still preaching, you know. Um, people want to know, are you going to, are you going to finish? Let me tell you something, folks. God's saving grace isn't part way. It's all the way. Huh? So these folks that come in the front door and they hit out the back door, and I don't know if every church has got them, but there's like a secret escape door somewhere by the baptistry. I don't know where, but it's somewhere back there because there's a lot of times they go through the water and then they find that. And then they get out and never come back. Let me tell you something. 
Jesus don't save you halfway, partway. He don't quit midway. You understand? He begins the good work. But I want you to understand something. You got to count the cost, though. When you start following after Jesus, he has an expectation out of you. Now, he saves you and he keeps you by his grace and he starts the good work. He will be, bring it to completion, but he expects you and I to willfully follow after him. It's just not when it feels good. Not just when it's convenient. Not just, oh man, that was a powerful uh, worship service and I'm pumped up and excited. Or not just when it's a new year and it makes sense to make a resolution. No, it's when it's in the middle of the year. It's when you forgot about your resolution. It's when you're on the mountaintop or in the valley. It's when all hell seems to be coming against you. Or it's when you feel like you can take it on with a water pistol. But it's about being committed to him. It's about taking those steps and counting the cost, you know, it's like the man counting the cost to make sure he can finish it. It's like the king going to battle, wondering, can I beat this other king? I've only got 10,000 troops. He's got 20,000 troops. Can I handle this? And can the 10,000 beat the 20? Yeah, sometimes they can. If you got the right tactics, if you got the right uh, uh, armor, or you got the right weapons, I mean, you got the right technology, I mean, shoot. That terrorist over in Iran, they just hit a button on the drone. He disappeared. So you got the right technology. You got the right things. You can 10,000 and beat 20,000. But if you go out there and think, I got 10,000, they got 20,000. We got the same weapons. We got the same armor. Um, we're going to be standing out there fighting in an open field. Um, I better reconsider some things. Because just by simple attrition, I'm probably going to lose this. So this two to one, them 10,000 probably going to die before the 20,000. So even if there's 100 of those left, they still 100 left. So I better figure out. You got to count the cost. You got to consider. Now, is Jesus trying to tell them and try to talk them out of following him? No. But what he wants them to understand and what I want us to understand today is that there is a cost in following Jesus. Your friends ain't always going to be there. Your family ain't always going to be on board. Huh? Everything ain't just going to be how I want it, and God bless that part, please. That's not how it works. And there's too many in the church that's how we live. Like I said, Wednesday night. I'm telling you, if we didn't have shift workers at Victory Baptist Church, we'd have a full house. You say, what do you mean? Oh, we just play tag team. Hey, this is your Sunday. Bam, you're it. I'm not showing up till it's my shift. Hello? You don't have to amen that either because it's the facts. You don't have 60, 70, 80 on the board. You'd have 100, have 120. You wouldn't have to worry about if, if we're going to have enough offering to, to do what we need to do or to go forward. We don't have to worry about that. Uh-uh. No. If we have folks show up like they're supposed to show up consistently, give like they're supposed to give, serve like they're supposed to serve, guess what? You don't have to worry about that. That's just the facts. He said, Brother Andy, you went to meddling. No. I just seen him shooting straight this morning. I think made a New Year's resolution. No more beating around the bush. You say, you didn't do it much anyway. I know, I just cut it down now. Just cut it down. No more bushes. I don't like landscape much anyway. Too much work. Uh, but all jokes aside, you know, commitment. If we weren't on shifts, this is my week, next week's your week. You know, this is my month, next week's your month. And if we didn't have that, 
If we was committed, it would be different, wouldn't it? It would be. You don't have to answer it. It would be. He says, likewise, what, whosoever he be of you that forsake not all. All. We love that word all when we think about who can be saved. All can be saved, right? I'm thankful for that. But he also said, those who are not willing to forsake all cannot be my disciple. Man, that's some strong words. That big old crowd, the great multitude that was pumped up in following Jesus, they started saying, I don't know about that. What about forsake all? Forsake all. I don't know about it. Jesus said to that man, let the dead bury the dead. Jesus said to the man, okay, they, got, they said to him, I'll, I'll come, let me go tell everybody goodbye. He said, the man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back ain't fit for the kingdom of God. There's too many of us plowing like this. That's why our lane looks like this. Can't get consistent. Huh? All over the place. You're going to plow right. You don't look down in front of you. You look out in front of you. Not, you don't look down the ground. You got to look out here. And you push that way. It's amazing how that works. Same thing with driving, right? You teach them kids how to drive. You don't teach them to look right two foot in front of the car. You tell them to look out front. See what's out there. Same thing when you're plowing. Same thing when you're looking for living for Jesus. You got to look to the cross. You got to look for his return. You got to stay straight. You don't look back. You don't look back at Egypt. You don't, oh, man, I wish I was back there in Egypt. I had a, a pot full of meat instead of this manna come out of him. Sometimes I struggle. I think about it financially. I think, man, man, look, look at that. Look, look how the, the, it just seems everything getting balanced in my checking account. After I pay all the bills, it's zero. And you're like, man, how you do that? Ain't got nothing in the savings account much. Ain't got none of this. It's like, God, remind me. When they went out and ate manna, how much I let them keep? None. But did they eat every day? Sure did. Did they have the clothes they needed? They sure did. Did they have the drink they needed? They sure did. Was he with them? He sure was. I don't sweat it no more. It's like, you know what? I ain't got to trust in that. I trust in him. This is what happens when we ain't committed to him. And this Stephanie, if you don't make your way up, those are going to help. Verse 34 and 35 says this, salt is good. Has purpose. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith it should be seasoned. It's neither fit for the land nor yet for a dunghill. But men cast it out. He that hath an ear, let him hear. You know what Jesus, or what Paul rather said to the church? He said, He said he didn't want to be a castaway. He didn't want to be a castaway. And what he was talking about was, didn't want to be a person who is a waste for Jesus. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about your life as a saved person not meaning anything to Jesus? And I'm not saying he, you don't mean nothing to him. What I mean is to live a life that there's real no purpose. You know, why else do we exist? To live in this old world, die. What did you What did you leave behind? Revelation says those who die in the Lord, they rest, but their work shall follow them. What that means is those of us that live for Christ, when you die, guess what? Those things keep on going. You still make an impact. What about us who don't do nothing for Jesus? We're supposed to be salt and light, but the salt that loses savor ain't fit for anything. I don't want to be that. Do you? I don't want to be the one that ain't fit for nothing. You know? 
I don't want to be that. I want to be the person that's committed to the Lord. I want to be the person that makes a difference. The person that's in his hands. Don't you want to be that? If you know, know Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, don't you want to be that? It's a church. Don't we want to be that? I, lo I love coming here, but that ain't all I want to do. I don't want us just to gather on Sundays and Wednesdays and think that's what we've done. Is we accomplished something? We've not accomplished nothing. I want us to, to grow. I want us to, to, to make a difference in this world. I want to see you become more like Jesus. I want to see me become more like Jesus. I want to see these pews fill up. I want us to see this neighborhood make a difference. Let me tell you something. Man, I mean, no better opportunity than right here. Right now, make a difference in this whole world. People need Jesus, folks. Amen. Whether they see it or not, they need him. What about you? Has God spoke to your word, to your heart? How are you going to respond to him today? That's what it amounts to. What are you going to do with his word? Crowd's there. What part of the group are you? John chapter 6. Jesus said, you got to eat my flesh, drink my blood. You have no part of me. And the crowd started thinning out again. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you two going to leave? Y'all going to leave too? Hey, you got to make a choice. You going to follow the crowd that's leaving him? You going to go with him like Peter said. Where are we going to go? Peter had a little bonehead things going on in his life, but he said some pretty straight, powerful things. And one of them was, where are we going to go? You're the only one that has salvation. You are the Christ. You're the Son of God. Where else are we going to go, Lord? That's my question. Where else are you going to go? Huh? Follow him and be committed to him? Or what else are you going to do? Tell me what even comes close to where your commitment should be. Hmm? Let's pray. Father, we bow before you this morning, ask you to move during the invitation. Lord, your word is true. Oh, it's powerful. But man, I thank you for it. I thank you for working in my heart this morning. I know I preach, but Lord, you preach right to me. Lord, I thank you for that. And I pray that we would take heed and hold of your word. If there's someone lost who needs to be saved, I pray they come and give their life to you. For us who are saved, I pray that we would take heed to what you have to say to us. As it said, he that hath ears, let him hear. May our ears be used and may the word take root in our hearts. And may we respond to you this morning as we give you the honor and glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.